Good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me there, uh, all around the world, wherever you are. Welcome to the second Spotlight Mining e-conference event. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. We know there's other events happening concurrently around the world, so uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, firstly, I want to wish you and your families all the best of health in this difficult time. I hope you're all safe and well, uh, wherever you are. Um, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Liam Hardy, and I write the Tales from the COVID Bunker daily mining newsletter. Uh, I also manage the Spotlight Mining channels. Secondly, I need to start this event with some uh, housekeeping notices, and then we'll crack on with our presentations and Q&A se session. So, one moment. So please be aware that nothing presented here today or discussed in our chat rooms should be considered financial advice. We recommend you conduct your own research and seek professional guidance before making any investments. Investing puts your capital at risk, so only ever invest what you can afford to lose. As today's topic concerns healthcare, I want to point out that we are not medical professionals. You should always follow the advice of the World Health Organization, your local authorities and your qualified medical practitioners. Uh, with regards to your safety during these times. So with uh, formalities over, I would like to um, encourage you to use the Q&A and chat features at the bottom of your window right now. Uh, you can ask our participants questions uh, directly. You can also chat amongst yourselves as much as you like there. Um, our presenters will either answer those privately or we can raise them during the Q&A session at the end of this. So without further ado, I'd like to move on to our first presenter, Jorge, who's joining us today from Santiago in Chile. Jorge, can you hear me there? Hi there, Jorge, can you hear me? Oh uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, Matt, you're live. If you'd like to uh, tell us a bit about yourself and go ahead, cheers. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Jorge Sangüesa. I'm here in Santiago. Uh, I'm an exploration geologist. I worked for uh, almost 10 years uh, with the uh, Anglo American, um, based uh, basically here in uh, in Chile, but uh, with some some works also in uh, Peru and uh, in Arizona in the U.S. Um, and uh, I'm transitioning now to a consulting world um, and I'm based at the moment here in Santiago. That's great, yeah. So if you'd like to go ahead with your presentation and tell us all about uh, South America at this time and uh, yeah, how you're dealing with the, the coronavirus in your region, cheers. Okay, perfect. Um, So I'm going to uh, I'm going to start. Can, can you see the presentation? By the way, at the moment, is is is, is it okay? Yeah. So um, I'm going to start with the um, with a short background uh, of the region. So, in terms of uh, production, uh, South America hosts uh, about forty five percent of the global copper production at the moment. Um, almost half of the silver and um, almost a quarter uh, of the molybdenum and um, about 20% of the zinc and 20% uh, of the gold worldwide production. Uh, iron ore in Brazil and lithium, uh, especially in Argentina and Chile are also quite significant, uh, especially during the last years. Um, in terms of exploration, on the other hand, uh, region still remains as uh, one of the main destination of the global um, exploration expenditures. Um, this chart showed the information uh, of the budget for uh, non-ferrous exploration expenditure last year, information from uh, Standards and Poor's. And we can see uh, that South America uh, actually hosts 22% uh, of uh, global expenditures. Um, I'm not including here Mexico. Uh, I have separated. Uh, just to include the, the South American current situation. So um, we can see basically that South America is hosting effectively a most part of the, of the exploration expenditures at the moment. Um, so in terms of, um, 
of the money. So where, where is this money um, uh, being spent at the moment? So we can see here uh, a brief summary of the different uh, metallogenic regions in South America. So basically we have uh, all across the, all along the Western border, uh, we see the Andean chain um, where most of the copper and gold production is based. Uh, largely based in the Northern Chile and South Peru uh, with different belts along the, 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 the Andean chain. And, um, and here basically you have the big mines located. So Chukicamata, Escondida and all the big exploration projects that are carrying out at the moment in this part of, the, of South America. Uh, secondly, uh, in the north east part of the of South America region, you have the the Brazilian uh, craton or the Amazon craton, uh, where basically we can um, we can find uh, iron ore and orogenic gold uh, belt mines and projects. So <clears throat> historically, uh, most of the iron ore production in Brazil comes from from the north part of the country. And, uh, but also you have this um, arcs here as uh, Carajas belt and uh, Moyas belt here, where during the last years, some uh, base metal projects also have been uh, under, under development. And uh, lastly, you have this region in the South uh, where you have the, um, the Patagonian Massif, where basically you have projects uh, of epithermal uh, gold and silver, like uh, Cerro Vanguardia in, in, in the Santa Cruz region in Argentina. In terms of uh, the exploration, what's going on with exploration here in South America at the moment, or what was happening before the crisis, um, so we can say that uh, vast territories in South America remain still quite unexplored. Uh, the classic example of this is Ecuador, which uh, has been a very uh, uh, interesting uh, exploration point during the last years after the discovery of uh, Cascabel projects. So uh, many big companies are, are working in Ecuador at the moment, uh, BHP, uh, Anglo American, uh, Codelco, Vale, um, so Ecuador is definitely or uh, has been a hotspot during the last uh, years. Um, an interesting aspect is also happening in Colombia now after the end of the, the guerrilla, uh, which uh, used to control uh, vast zones of the territory. So it's a very interesting uh, thing now. Um, even uh, in countries with the more mature exploration if you want in terms of uh, in terms of the the, the, the production uh, um, like Chile and Peru uh, in these places you can still find very um, uh, positive perspective in the future uh, basically uh, in areas previously underexplored or with a new uh, business approach uh, particularly in Chile uh, if you think uh, that not necessarily everything is about big porphyry coppers. Um, in Brazil, uh, large uh, mining areas um, where um, previous uh, works only focus on uh, iron ore are now being liberated uh, and are being taken by other companies thinking not only uh, in exploration for gold, but also for exploration of base metals. Um, and sorry, and in Argentina, uh, despite the financial uncertainties that uh, normally we have uh, from Argent Argentina, uh, some potential good perspective uh, can be observed in uh, in the Mendoza region, where historically uh, the use the use of uh, cyan and use was not allowed uh, in mining, which basically means that uh, open pits were not allowed in this region. So recently the government lifted this, um, um, this banning. So of course, is a, I mean, it might be a potential uh, good news for exploration in that part of the world, which is uh, very interesting from a geological point of view. 
Um, so let's see uh, what's going on now uh, in terms of the, of the emergency. Uh, so here we can see the confirmed cases by country. Uh, this is updated until, um, yeah, Tuesday. So by far Brazil is uh, leading with, uh, with the number of confirmed cases, uh, and which is expectable because of the population. Then we have Chile, which is not expectable at all because uh, we are here only uh, 18 million people. Um, and then we have Ecuador, which is not expectable at all either because uh, um, it's only 17 million people. And then the rest of the, of the countries in, uh, in Latin America. This is basically explained uh, by the quantity of tests that uh, are being carried out by the, by the authorities, and especially in Chile. Mm -hmm. um, this is the distribution of the cases uh, in the region. Uh, in terms of death, the situation is uh, quite different. Uh, so we can see that Brazil is effectively uh, again uh, with the, the majority of cases. But then uh, we see that Chile, for instance, uh, is only uh, 12 uh, back then. Uh, I don't know the numbers today. This situation is changing every day, of course. Um, in, Equ in Ecuador, we have a problem at the moment. So I, I would say that situation is more critical in Ecuador than any other country in South America at the moment. Uh, here, the evolution. So basically, we can see that uh, it's going faster in Brazil and Chile. But again, this is strongly dependent on the uh, effective tests that uh, are effectively uh, uh, being carried out by different countries and, and the local authorities. Uh, so what's going on in terms of uh, the measures taken by the government? Uh, so uh, in red, um, we, we see the, the, the countries where mandatory lockdowns are, are uh, at the moment. Um, Brazil and Chile, uh, we have only partial lockdowns. So in, um, concentrated in specific cities uh, where the emergency is, is, is going worst. Uh, we are in a, in a, in a, in a total uh, lockdown here in, in Santiago at the moment. Uh, and Uruguay, which is going uh, to a partial lockdown actually, uh, because this information is probably a couple of years ago. So uh, situation again is changing every day. So what is the situation at least here in Chile at the moment? Uh, apparently measures taken uh, by the government seems to be controlling the expansion of the emergency. Um, despite some, some, some minor disruptions, most of the big mines in the north and in the central part of the country are um, still operating. Uh, this is again so far because all of this is tangible. We, we have seen uh, that uh, many cases have been uh, appearing during, the, during this week. Um, so we have to see what's gonna, what's gonna happen uh, next days. Um, also, some unions, some, some workers' union in big mines like Escondida, for instance, are complaining about uh, more effective uh, uh, safety measures because of the health emergency. So all of this is quite changeable at the moment. It's, it's, it's changing at every moment. Um, anyway, we can expect some negative impacts on production performance. Um, and this is basically because of uh, uh, delays on the supply chains. Um, effect of the person lockdown on uh, flying flyout uh, systems because we have that here in Chile uh, is different from Australia in terms of distance before uh, of course but uh, many people used to live in the capital uh, and work in uh, big operations in the north which is uh, about uh, 2,000 kilometers away from the city so you have many people traveling all the time uh, because of uh, mining in the north um, and reduced staff, of course, uh, most of the operation, all companies, big uh, and small companies are working with uh, reduced teams. So only essential people is working in the, in the places in order to, to maintain the production and uh, the uh, maintenance of different equipment. But most of people, especially exploration, is working from home at the moment. Um, in the same way, so Greenfield and Brownfield exploration have been almost entirely cancelled 
or postponed. Uh, and this includes, of course, majors and junior companies. So all drilling campaigns, uh, typically in the north, northern Chile and southern Peru, are not working at the moment. Probably with the, some uh, specific exceptions, of course. And uh, the other thing that we have seen within the last day uh, is that many projects, uh, many construction or development project expansions, for instance, has been uh, stopped or slowed or uh, put under review um, due to the, 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 the situation now. The, the, probably the most important example is uh, Quebrada Blanca, the, the uh, phase number two, which is an, a, a big expansion of the mine. And uh, Codelco, the state-owned uh, company uh, producer in Chile, um, they said that they're going to put under review uh, the structural projects, uh, which are projects in order to maintain the production uh, for for the for the next uh, for the next years. Uh, so all of this is quite expectable and uh, might affect the 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 supply of copper. I mean the, the short term uh, supply uh, because of the of the um, um, disruptions in, in the mines at the moment, but also the the, the future um, uh, supply uh, due to the uh, slower work that we can see in these uh, projects or the construction of the future mines. Um, Let's talk about the, the other countries of the region. So in Peru, uh, situation is, is similar in terms of, uh, of the mines. So most of mines, especially big ones, are still operating. Um, in Peru, there is a, a total lockdown at the moment. Um, so um, the government have uh, guaranteed that mines uh, can remain operating, but again, um, we have uh, a lot of minings located in very remote places in Peru, and uh, those operations have been struggling in terms of uh, maintaining the production. So we have both situation in Peru at the moment. Uh, so closures and um, some others are still operating, but of course in a in a slower uh, way. Um, Queyareco has been uh, has slowed um, its uh, operation, uh, of course because of the impact of lockdown. Um, Queyadeco is, is an Anglo American mine uh, which is expected to uh, start production soon. So, again, it's uh, a potential big impact uh, for, the, for the future supply. Uh, in Brazil, the uh, situation is like Chile in terms of the, the measures of uh, uh, social distancing. So, there is no total lockdown at the moment. Um, companies have only reduced operation at the moment, uh, but again, uh, because of the of the of the problem with the traveling, uh, some closures uh, in remote areas uh, are being observed uh, during the last uh, days. Uh, vale, uh, the the giant uh, iron ore producer, reported that for sure it's going to be an impact in uh, there is no big uh, impact on operation at the moment, but there will be for sure a reduction of at least uh, 18 million tons of iron ore in the production. Um, in Argentina, uh, there is a total lockdown now. Um, and this is where most of uh, mines are effectively stopping operations. Uh, that has been happening in the um, lithium mines in the north. Um, and some mines in the south, uh, gold mines in the Santa Cruz province, uh, like San Jose mine. Um, and Cerro Gordo, uh, uh, Cerro Moro, sorry for uh, of Yamana uh, Gold, will keep operating, but again in a reduced way uh, during the period of lockdown, which is at least for two weeks ahead. Uh, and in Argentina, unlike Peru, Brazil, Chile, and even Colombia, uh, mining has not been uh, declared as an essential activity at the moment. That's why in Chile and Peru, things are going smoother at the moment because uh, government uh, protect the mining activity because it's a big part of the GDP on those countries. It's different from Argenti Argentina in that way. 
Uh, in Colombia, the situation is quite uh, similar in terms of uh, production. Many uh, big coal producers, Cerejón and Drummond, have announced a strong reduction in its operation, but still uh, uh, are under operation, but very reduced. And in Ecuador, as I said, the situation is quite critical at the moment in terms of the, uh, of the emergency. Um, Fruta del Norte uh, from uh, London Gold and Mirador uh, are two gold and copper mines uh, which started uh, or entered in production um, last year. And uh, those are temporarily shut down at the moment uh, because uh, the lockdown is uh, uh, quite strict there because of the of the of the intensity of the emergency in Ecuador. So overall, we can say that uh, production of copper and gold is still uh, going in the region. And uh, as I said at the beginning, it's very important because uh, this region is responsible for almost 45% of copper supply. Uh, so overall, the production is still going, but this is changeable. Uh, I mean, the, the, the emergency is still here and it's gonna be here for at least one month. So operations are reacting in a different way, but again, this is very changeable. We have to see what's gonna to happen tomorrow, what's gonna to happen next week. And, uh, and I would say that the, more, the most important effect on all of this, uh, in order to see this effect, we have to wait. So we have to wait that the emergency passed and uh, we're gonna see what's gonna happen after this because most of projects and constructions and mine uh, still be, I mean, will be still working, but uh, in, a, in a very different way. So the, um, we, we have to wait what's gonna happen when, when the mines reopen and what's gonna be the price when the mines and projects reopen. Uh, so the intensity of the, of the effects of all of this, we're gonna see them basically when the emergency is finished here. So we are on emergency now and uh, the, all of this is quite tangible at the moment. It's very difficult to say what's gonna be the effect, but at the moment the supply is not gonna, is not gonna be affected in a very, massive way unless the lockdowns uh, extend for a month. You know? So that's uh, my summary of the situation here in South America. Liam. Thank you very much, Jorge. It's a very uh, thorough presentation on all the countries there. That's great. Um, some really good graphs in there as well. Um, I think a, a few people requested copies of those. So we'll send out uh, your presentation if that's okay with you as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. yeah, so just a quick question uh, from me. You've mentioned a lot of people are working from home on the exploration front, um, whether voluntarily or, or not. That means there's a lot of desk study being done, a lot of uh, hardcore interrogation of data. Do you think when people go back out into the fields, they're going to be much more efficient uh, at exploration uh, than if they hadn't done all this desk study? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um... I mean, the, the fact that you have many people working from home, uh, we would expect that people is more concentrated and you have, you have, um, you don't have the, this, this classic problem when you are in operations, uh, even in exploration, this problem of uh, being a firefighter all the time. Mm -hmm. So just worried about what's going on on that day. So it's very interesting what's gonna happen when people have time to think over the data and have time to relax if you want, to see the information that they haven't seen for a while. I mean, if you ask me, I think that is very, very interesting, especially when in brownfield exploration, especially in places like Chile, where you have more projects historically, where the, 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 the exploration is more mature if you want. So it's very interesting that we, sit back and okay so let's let's see the information again let's think about this you know in in, in home <laughs> uh so even when i win a, win a cup of wine if you want but uh you know but, it always but helps think, to clear the mind eh? <laughs> yeah yeah so i think that that 
might be a positive effect of all of this, but of course we have to wait. But yes, mo most of people are effectively working from home, even in exploration, especially in big companies. And as, as I said, many of the drilling campaigns are stopped now. So yeah, people are working. Thank you very much. Jorge. Exploration is not an essential. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Jorge. Uh, we'll come back to you in the Q&A. Uh, I'm sure there's yep. going to be lots of questions about South America. There's a lot of English companies and Canadian companies out there, so everybody wants to know what's on the ground. So now we're going to go along to uh, my friend Tim Strong from Kangari Consulting and also Global Energy Metals. Tim, can you hear me there? I can. Can you hear me well? I can hear you clearly, yeah. So, Tim, if you'd like to uh, briefly introduce yourself and then uh, crack on with your presentation, that'd be great. Cheers. Sure. I'm a, a consultant geologist that's uh, worked in the industry for over 11 years now. Uh, a big chunk of that was in West Africa with uh, Perseus mining, uh, Electo Minerals and uh, Resolute mining. Um, so I've spent quite a lot of time in West Africa, uh, got into the consulting business around two years ago. Uh, and still a considerable amount of my work is in West Africa, as well as here in the Caribbean and, and North America. Uh, and as you mentioned, I'm also the project development manager for Global Energy Metals, a uh, uh, battery metal company focused in Nevada, Queensland, and Canada. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about West Africa and the effect of the uh, coronavirus on the operations in the Burumian Gold Belt. I can't share my screen until uh, Jorge has unshared the screen. Yeah. There we go. Are you all on there? <laughs> Let's see how this works. Uh, I can see you now, Tim. You can see me. Can you can see, see my you screen? Uh, I can just see you at the moment. Have you shared the screen at the bottom? I'm trying to do that. And that should work now. You should see it right now, I think. Yep, that's all there. Yep. Cheers. Perfect. Okay, so I gave you a, a little spiel about, about myself. Uh, my, my company is Kangari Consulting. Uh, we sort of work on an associateship model, um, working uh, mostly myself and a couple of key guys back in the UK. Uh, and we try and work all the way through the mining value chain uh, up to sort of feasibility level. We can bring people in, uh, mining engineers, metallurgists, environmental guys. Uh, but a lot of our work is on the sort of project generation, exploration planning, um, as well as sort of technical reports, we write a lot of 43101s for people um, and a lot of project due diligence for the capital markets. So on to West Africa, this is the, uh, the specific area I'm talking about. It's, you know, the Greenstone Belts, we're talking Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and to some extent, Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, as you can see, the yellow dots here on this, uh, on this map are, are the major gold deposits of the area. You can see it's pretty, uh, pretty full. Um, the map is not up to date. There's, there's still quite a few missing, which I think uh, shows you the, still the exploration potential in the region. Uh, as I mentioned, this is Burumian gold. We're talking about these are greenstone belts. They're 50 million years old plus. Uh, they're very well endowed. Um, we've got over 40 million ounces in um, in Mali alone. Uh, Ghana is one of the highest um, gold producers in the world. Uh, with Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal and Burkina Faso uh, sort of trying to catch up now. There's a lot of activity there. With all the major miners are there, Endeavour, Barrack, Perseus, Resolute, Golden Star, Newmont. Uh, there's some, some smaller guys there, Rocks Gold, Desert Gold, uh, Oriole, Orca, uh, Zaranu. Um, so it's a, it's a very active region. Um, here's some of the production numbers. These are from 2008. You can see China and Australia there at the top with over 400,000 tons for China. Uh, and then you see the values for Ghana, Mali, Burkina and Cote d'Ivoire, which are considerably smaller. But of interest is if you look at the country area sizes, 
So you look at Australia, it's uh, 7.6 million kilometers squared. And if you add up all the, uh, the, the four West African countries there, it comes into a seventh of the size of Australia, producing almost the same tonnage of gold. So the region is um, a lot smaller than its competitors, but uh, I would say a lot more well endowed. So moving on to the coronavirus or the COVID-19 in West Africa, you can see compared to Jorge's presentation, the number of cases is considerably smaller. Um, this is likely to not actually be the case. There's probably a lack of testing in these countries and uh, any of you that have traveled to West Africa will appreciate how remote the uh, countries are. So getting tests out into remote villages, remote towns is probably very difficult. So the numbers you're seeing here, they may look relatively small, but they're probably likely to be a lot higher. This is some of the news released from some of the companies that are uh, in production in West Africa. Uh, we've got news releases from Endeavor saying that their production is, is still on target. Resolute also have their production on target. Um, Iron Gold were a little bit different. They, they had cases in their Toronto office shortly after PDAC, which I'm sure gave everyone a little bit of, uh, a, little bit of a scare. Um, but currently their mines in West Africa are still operating and um, no production loss as of yet. Uh, Anglo Gold um, in Ghana had a, uh, a case at their mine uh, in Ghana. Um, but again, that hasn't uh, affected production as of yet. Um, what I am seeing is a lot of junior companies have stopped production, uh, stopped production in terms of expiration. Um, expatriate staff have been kept out. This is, this is due to companies implementing their own safety policies and also countries being on lockdown. Uh, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, they've all closed their borders despite the relatively low number of coronavirus cases. So uh, even, even these larger companies, Resolute, have stopped all their near mine exploration. Um, the same for Endeavor. They're just keeping production up. And, and what a, a lot of tactic of these miners is that they are relying a lot on stockpiles. So even if they do lose key staff, um, they can still carry on processing. That leads me on to the human capital cost which I think is one of the biggest things uh, for these mining companies in Africa. Uh, when I was working in Africa, I was often doing nine weeks on, three weeks off, or six weeks on, two weeks off. If you can no longer leave the country and fly home because there's no international flights, you could be pulling rotations that are three months, four months long. Uh, that doesn't just affect your physical health, that affects your mental health. Uh, this causes safety issues for, for miners. How long can you physically have people working on site before they need a break? Um, obviously, this on the flip side of that is the extended vacations. Your, your back to back can't get to site to, to relieve you. So they're at home doing nothing. You're, you're on site. There's no way you can be changed. So companies are going to have to think, you know, this, is, this has been going on for a relatively short time, just a, a month or two now uh, in Africa. People are going to have to start deciding do we cut production in order to care for our employees or do we just make our employees work and give them a six-month vacation uh, the problem with that is your back-to-back -back is also not going to want to come and work for six weeks uh, six months so are we going to see a hiring boom in the mining industry so that we have to you know have three people for for every job that that's yet to be seen uh, another one of the issues with the human capital is some of your key workers will be off-site. Senior managers could be back in Australia or Canada or, or the UK, and they're unable to get in. Um, and many of you that have worked on a, on a mine site in West Africa, these, these key management in figures are, are very important. And, you know, you can go without them for one or two weeks when they're on a break. But, um, you know, the, the regime needs to be, to be followed. This also... Um, also means the, the same for importation of parts and maintenance staff. Um, you know, if you have a large breakdown at a, at a crusher or a, uh, I believe Resolute had some issues back in October with their, with their roaster, uh, which luckily they got fixed before, uh, before this uh, Corona outbreak. Um, 
but if you have a, a large piece of equipment go wrong, you can't necessarily have the maintenance staff on, on site to, to fix that. You have to bring in specialists. Uh, that also can't happen right now. So that, that could be a cause of shutdown in the future. Uh, as I mentioned before, the mental health of workers, um, you know, even, even nine weeks in a country can be pretty tiring uh, and tough on the mental health. Uh, you know, once you start extending that to 18 weeks, 21 weeks, you know, it, it's the, the human uh, toll there could, could be quite high. Uh, and then the, the, the final issue on the human capital side is healthcare in countries. The, the healthcare in West Africa is, is pretty poor, uh, even in the major cities. Um, it's, it's very unlikely that you would get any level of treatment like you would back in the, in the Western world. So if you were to, to get sick, um, or if a corona outbreak happened on, on one of these mine camps where you, know, you can often have five or 600 people living in closed quarters, um, how, how well could you be treated? So coming, coming out of that, um, something I've been following quite closely from, from my time at, at Resolute is the rise of automation in mining. Um, at Resolute mining um, are at the forefront of this uh, process in Africa. I, I'm aware other companies, uh, Rio Tinto and the Pilbara, for example, are also implementing automated mines, but certainly in Africa and definitely West Africa, Resolute are the, are the key players um, with their partnership with Sandvik. Uh, they are developing a fully automated underground mine. And this extends to drilling, blasting, trucking, crushing, Everything can be done from a uh, remote uh, work site. Everyone is behind computers. Uh, this doesn't even have to be done in, in country. So the Resolute are based in Mali. They don't need the operation center to be in Mali. It can be in Perth or in London. Um, and this, this, for the future, will mitigate some of the effects of a global viral pandemic because your staff are already um, in one place, typically in a place with good healthcare, and who knows, in, in the future with, with automation, maybe we can all work from home and drive the trucks, <laughs> as opposed to, uh, to being in one centralized office. Um, the automation of, of these mines is not just obviously a corona uh, benefit, it's, it's something that's going to happen all over the world. It's, it is the new way of doing things, it keeps costs down. It keeps work time up. These, these automated mines can work for, for 24 hours a day. There's very little breakdown. Um, obviously, maintenance is still done on site, but with a much more of a skeleton crew. Um, and the production can be a lot more consistent. And you know, it's going to cut your bottom line and make everyone a lot more money. And uh, that, that's it for me. So if you have any questions, that would be, uh, be great. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, that was a really informative talk and about the right length of time as well. <laughs> Cheers okay. for that. Um, so I've got um, some more broad questions, uh, knowing you uh, a little bit more personally. You've discussed West Africa and your experience there, but you've also, uh, you're based in the Caribbean and you've worked in Jamaica. Uh, how are you finding uh, the situation there at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in Jamaica, I've been engaged working with Geophysics Jamaica. It's a, a private uh, company. Um, run by run by Jamaicans, staffed by Jamaicans, um, doing a massive amount of exploration there. Um, I think the the current land holding is eighteen hundred square kilometers of licenses over the whole island. Uh, something like sixteen thousand soil samples. Uh, drill rig is about to start turning. Aeromagnetic surveys. It's massive, and this has all gone under the radar because it's a private company. Um, we have teams in Jamaica out in the field right now. We, we feel it's the safest place for them. Um, Jamaica has quite a strong economic uh, position. However, a lot of people work in the service industry and the in, in hospitality, tourism, uh, and a lot of these people are being laid off. So, so the team at Geophysics Jamaica feel it's important to keep our staff employed, keeping them out in the field for as long as possible. Uh, just so that A, we can continue work programs, but B, these families have some support and money coming into them. Uh, Jamaica is similar to the rest of the Caribbean. We've had pretty, uh, pretty low amount of, of cases. 
here in St. Kitts and Nevis, we have uh, just eight cases so far. But again, in a, in a similar vein to, to West Africa, the healthcare system here would be quickly overwhelmed. Yes, and I think uh, you actually had a question for Jorge earlier, which, uh, which you sent to me in the chat, but maybe you want to pose that directly if, uh, if we can unmute, unmute Jorge. Uh, absolutely. So, so my question was, um, obviously, South America comes with quite a high level of political risk, um, Argentina in, in particular, uh, but also, also Ecuador. Uh, do you see the, the political risk being higher than the risk of Corona, which, which puts off investors more, the, the Corona risk currently or the, or the long-term political risk in South America? Yeah, I mean, you're right. And I fully agree. The, the political risk in South America is, is quite high. I mean, the situation is quite different from, from one country to another, but in general, is a, is a high risk uh, for, for this region. And in that sense, I would say that the coronavirus problems or emergency is uh, on top of the previous problem. So we have two emergencies uh, here uh, right now. So one historical one, if you want, the political uh, problems and, and, and the coronavirus is an additional one. So yeah, it's, it's gonna be even harder for us if, 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 you, if you want to, uh, to pass this time. I, as, I, as I said, uh, effects of the coronavirus we're gonna see uh we're gonna see them after this uh because it's gonna be basically because of the prices the, of the price of metals so how uh quickly uh we will be able to recover um it's, it's highly dependent on prices and and our economies are highly dependent on the on um on, on, on metals, you know, so, so we are highly dependent on what, what happened in China. So yeah, that's a risk. I, I wouldn't say that this uh, is a higher risk compared to the coronavirus at the moment, because it's, it's hard to say now, because the situation is very, is, is, is very changeable. Uh, we have to see what's gonna happen during the next days. But yeah, it's, it's a fact, definitely it's a fact. And we are dealing with two problems here. One historical, which is political risk, and this new problem, which is the coronavirus emergency. So uh, Peter Hodgkins has commented there to say he's more concerned about uh, COVID-19 uh, than, uh, than the regional political situation. Uh, we've also got another question, which uh, I'll put to you guys and try and answer myself, um, which says, uh, are we saying that the majors are the place to be investing as they'll be able to work through Corona shutdowns or should we all be rushing around looking to buy up the juniors as soon as the restrictions are lifted? Yeah, look, I, I, I think the, the majors are still a pretty safe haven. Um, some of the stuff I discussed there, you know, with, with Resolute and, and Endeavor, uh, having stockpiles to utilize should they have to go to skeleton crews. Um, it's really a case of how long this will go on for. Uh, the, good, the good thing with junior companies now is they're conserving cash. Uh, conserving cash, and as, as Jorge said, uh, a lot of people are doing desk-based work right now. So they're going to come back into the field with a, with a much better footing um, whilst having not had a massive amount of cash burn. Um, the, the majors are going to weather it well, uh, as long as it doesn't go on for too long. If, if this situation uh, continues for two, three, four months, uh, like I told you, the, the human capital costs, you know, they're, they're going to have to get people out of there. They're going to have to get people in. And if that's not possible, there's going to be no choice but to, to shut down. Uh, and the, the cost of that is, is much, much higher than keeping junior miners at home. You know, the juniors can stay at home. They can shut down their office, everyone can work from home, cut salaries, and your, your cash burn can be very, very minimal. Major companies can't do that. Yeah. So we've now got uh, Paul Metcalf joining us from Oramex Resource Corp. Uh, I actually gave Paul the wrong time to, uh, to come online here, so it's completely my fault. But uh, he's joining us by phone. Uh, Paul, can you hear me there? I can indeed. And, and uh, my apologies to your audience for, for a late arrival. Um, complete, and, uh, my, and my apologies for, uh, for my ugly mug not being on screen, but there are some things nobody should be seeing first thing in the morning, which is what it is here. Good morning all or good afternoon in Europe. Thank you very much. So, Paul, you were going to give us a talk, um, just you know, a brief introduction to the mining industry in Canada and then how you think the industry has been affected um, you know, with the coronavirus. Maybe you could give us just a few minutes uh, on that now. 
I can. Um, I'll be without uh, visual aids here, but the, it's uh, quite um, basic, the, the presentation I was going to give. Uh, we live uh, remote from Vancouver on a small island in, uh, in, near Vancouver Island. And uh, British Columbia at the moment, although there is a lot of uh, streaming on the media about this, uh, has been affected with, I think, a total of uh, just over a thousand cases in as of March 30th, which, given that the province's total population is five million, uh, we have barely been affected. And uh, the, the BC Health uh, Services have an excellent website, which um, shows that the majority of the detected infections are within what's known as the Lower Mainland, the area immediately around Vancouver, uh, with a very, very small um, number of, of uh, infections further up the province. Now, Liam, from his, uh, from his experience in British Columbia, will tell if you fold uh, Britain at the corners slightly, you can probably fit the whole island comfortably in, into uh, British Columbia, uh, which prompts indignant um, uh, rejoinders from uh, the British people who say who would want to. However, the, uh, the, the virus has just started its impact, and I will make the remark here that nobody seems to know anything about it, and they are being very clear about that. The, the provincial uh, authorities in both Alberta and British Columbia, uh, Alberta being our immediate neighbor to the east, have managed this uh, situation extremely well. They are advising people to stay at home when possible, to work from home when possible, which is actually an advantage to those of us who have mountains of data from previous years and are just waiting to compile it. In terms of exploration in the province, uh, the, the social distancing, odious term but necessary, uh, you will consider, Liam, from your experience in, in a helicopter, exactly how social distancing might be managed in a helicopter. There have been uh, scurrilous suggestions that we manage it by strapping the field assistants to the skids of the helicopter, but that is not only um, reprehensible, it's also illegal. Uh, in short, British Columbia, which is remote of access, uh, will be difficult to visit unless you are with people you are intimately familiar with and you're working off a road. The provincial government, and this is the Ministry of Energy, Mines and Petroleum Resources, also reacted very promptly by extending the good two dates of mineral tenures in the province. Uh, they're still sorting themselves out as well uh, amid a number of unknowns, but the mineral tenures have been extended to the 31st of December of next year, which makes eminent good sense. One of the problems of British Columbia is its remote access, which means if you don't get in in the summer months and you don't have an operating mine, good luck uh, uh, trying to do exploration in the winter. You'll see a lot of snow, but very little else. In short, it's keep calm and carry on. And uh, we seem to have passed an initial curve of infections, but only a fool would, would make a, a prediction based on a thousand new cases. I really can't think of anything else to contribute except keep calm and carry on. If Vera Lynn can do it, we can. Thank you very much for that uh, by phone, Paul. So a uh, quick question for you. Um, there's a lot of major operations uh, in the area that uh, Oromex are operating in as well. You've got uh, Pretium down the road, you've got uh, the Red Dog Mine and Galore Creek being built. Um, have you heard any gossip about uh, what's going on there, how they're managing um, with, with the shutdowns? Uh, there, I've heard long grass rumors, nothing more. Um, Pretium, I've heard nothing about. Pretium, and this is a very good plug for the company, um, is uh, connected to the outside world by a road. The, that is crucial, um, the construction of a road. There was a road proposed to Galore Creek. There was a road proposed down um, the Iskut River to the north of Bruce Jack Lake. And there was a road into, some of you will remember, the Eskay Creek mine 
although the road was was locked up it was uh, it, it's still existing logistics are everything in that area um you mentioned uh, red mountain i think it's red mountain not red dog that is air access <laughs> yeah. and it is now um the property of ascot uh, resources ascot if they have any sense at all and they do. Uh, I know many, many of their uh, people, and they, they hired good people. Uh, we'll be working on the road accessible Silback Premier and Big Missouri areas, which um, are accessible by road through Alaska and have been for the last 200 years. Yeah. So now I think we'll, uh, we'll open up the Q&A to the whole panel. So if Tim and Jorge are there. I'm going to start with a question for Jorge, and then we're going to go around uh, Paul and Tim. Um, I've heard predictions from, you know, two weeks to 12 months as to how long we're going to be locked down for. How does the mining industry continue to operate safely and deliver resources that, that we need to, to be alive uh, if it's a 12 month shutdown? Uh, that's to Tim first, if you're there, Tim. To me, perfect. Um... Look, it's going to be very difficult. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, you know, you can't keep people on site. Uh, these are remote mines. We are going to rely a lot more on the mines that are, um, are, are well connected, such as those in Canada and, and North America. Uh, but, you know, such, such a high level of production comes out of Africa and not just West Africa. Uh, there's going to be some big supply issues. Um, this, this is the same for all, all metals, copper, um, nickel, uh, gold, cobalt, uh, everything, especially the battery, battery metals, um, you know, coming out of the Congo, 70% of the supply um, coming from the Congo and the rest from China. Uh, you know, I can see a, a, a large cobalt supply deficit uh, coming. And that's, that's going to, if, if this is to extend, as you say, to 12 months, we could be looking at a, a supply deficit on almost every metal, um, which is obviously going to increase the, Increase the prices, which you know, may make us all ha happy, but uh, you know a lot of these mines uh, potentially won't survive. Lots of the small ones, they they can't survive being on care and maintenance for a year and then having to ramp up. It's a very expensive process. Um, we we'll see. I, I, I personally don't think we're looking at twelve months. I think we're probably looking at midsummer before things start really picking up. Uh, and I think that. Uh, possibly the, the junior mining space will, will pick up a little bit quicker um, because less people on the ground, uh, less, less money involved. I think things can, can develop pretty quickly um, as soon as sort of air transport and stuff is, is opened up. Yeah, uh, that's you know, pretty much my thought as well with junior mining. Uh, anyone who reads my newsletter will know that I'm uh, plugging a lot of junior miners at the moment and putting my money into them as well as the, the smaller producers who are more remote so in areas like Newfoundland with Anaconda Gold and uh, Matsa Resources who are way out in the outback in Australia. These guys have had pretty much no impact because they've got you know rugged toothed miners who've lived on the mines their whole lives. Mm -hmm. So they didn't notice this. But uh, Jorge, uh, in South America, the economies are quite delicate when it comes to mining regions. Uh, they're often towns built entirely around the mine. Um, how how would a twelve month shutdown impact those those communities, and how could we maybe sensibly avoid it? Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I mean, if if the lockdown extend, uh, let's say beyond than one month, uh, it's going to be for sure a very very tough uh, uh, time for many many of the countries here. Uh, it's hard to say now because uh, most of mines here are not prepared for that. They are thinking that uh, lockdown is going to be about two or three weeks. I mean, total lockdowns like, like here. Uh, but again, it's, it's hard to say if it's going to be necessary to extend uh, these periods of, um, of uh, uh, measures. Hopefully not. Hopefully uh, measures taken by the, by the government uh, so far uh, it's, uh, it's enough, at least in order to stop or to uh, flatten the, the, the curve of, uh, of new cases. Uh, particularly in Chile, it seems um, it's working at the moment. Uh, so new cases daily are 
quite more or less stable in, in terms of uh, new cases detected. So I think it's not going to be necessary here to extend uh, the lockdown for us such as lo such a long period, at least in Chile. Uh, in Peru, situation is similar. Uh, there are more uh, cases there, uh, but uh, the government is is is, is quite um, um, aware about the importance of mining uh, for the entire industry. So I think even if the uh, lockdown extends. Um, uh, government and uh, supporting to the mining companies in order to uh, to remain production. So it's going to be tough and it's going to be very, very hard uh, time, uh, as not only for the production numbers. I mean, it, it, it might be a problem even in terms of safety. So you have less people on the operations and this includes, of course, uh, environmental and safety uh, um, um, uh, teams, for instance. So that's an issue too, you know, how's, how's gonna safety will be managed during this time of emergency. Yeah. So it is hard to say what's gonna happen if the, if the lockdown extends so much. Thank you very much, Jorge. So I've got a question here from uh, Erica, who I think is in New Mexico at the moment. Hi, Erica, if you can hear us. Um, to Paul from Oromex, uh, how is COVID-19 affecting Oromex's financial situation? Uh, what are your plans for 2020? Um, have they changed at all based on uh, the current crisis? Very good questions. Uh, firstly, uh, to, to second everything my colleagues just said about the mining industry and COVID, I want to make a sharp distinction between um, the mining industry and mineral exploration and the simplest definition will be uh, mineral exploration turns into mining when the padlock goes on the warehouse door. A mining operation, by definition, has to be a, a productive in terms of finance. You, you, you have to be productive or you go under, as my colleagues have just iterated. Mineral exploration differs in two respects. One, and this is an uncomfortable thing for a lot of financiers, our mandate is to lose money looking for mineralization and economic mineralization in the most effective way. And then we sell it, hopefully at a handsome profit. The second point I'd like to make, which has probably already been made in this, uh, in this seminar, is that we are dealing with a completely unknown um, entity here, which uh, our, our authorities have, have carefully and courteously concealed from us the fact that they don't know very much about, A, its level of contagiousness, since a, asymptomatic uh, infection appears to be common, and we have no idea of its percentage lethality, and they are obliged to make the worst possible uh, assumptions about both, which means they put... Um, considerable amount of restrictions uh, locally, and there is no criticism from me of these restrictions uh, on access to remote areas. We must also consider the uh, communities that live in these remote areas. I'm thinking particularly of the people of Gitwell Silk. To, if uh, anybody in this is listening, I apologize for my uh, reprehensible pronunciation. This is a community in the Niska nation uh, which lies to the south of our exploration area. And they are very concerned about uh, COVID getting loose um, in the elderly population. And I think that is an entirely valid concern. You are dealing also uh, with most populations, which I, uh, with, I'm not a medical doctor. I should have qualified that right from the outset. You're dealing with a virgin field infection, which could be particularly lethal to remote communities. Um, those of you with a classical education will recall uh, the, the Peloponnesian War and the Greek account of it, where they took the country folk into the city for their own protection from the invader, and then they all died in a plague. And these were the farmers, the people who worked the land, who were essentially irreplaceable. Turning to Oromex and what are plans, um, I'm going to introduce uh, the questioner to um, something I call Metcalfe's Law, and please quote this as, 
Necessity may be the mother of invention, but desperation is certainly the father. And these, while they're not desperate times, they certainly call for changes of plan. We're frankly playing it by ear uh, at the moment in terms of our plans for the summer. The constraints on social distancing and the constraints on access to remote communities mean that we will be consulting in detail and when a bit more is known about this virus before we go anywhere near remote communities. Fortunately, we have the ability not to do that. Uh, mineral exploration is by necessity an isolationist subject, and you don't have to keep an operation going unless you wish to raise money in the finance sector. As to the finance sector at the moment, uh, the levels of enthusiasm are below even their usual enthusiasm levels when it comes to funding mineral exploration juniors. At any rate, to borrow from history, um, this is what we are going to try to do. Uh, we are assembling a considerable database, which we uh, added to last summer and the summer before. We have uh, a mine uh, just south of Stewart, about 10 miles or 16 kilometers, depending which continent you live on. And uh, it is accessible only by air, but we have an immense database to go through. Until further notice, that is what we are going to be doing. We have just discovered some gems, like a ground geophysical survey that we had thought lost forever. Uh, we are going to explore remotely. Uh, we are going to explore uh, comprehensively, which is rarely allowed by the finance industry these days. And when, then we are going to go out and find another mine. Sorry about rabbiting on so long. Uh, <laughs> did that answer no the question? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, so the, the next question came from an anonymous uh, request. Um, probably best place to Tim. I'm just going to say hello to everyone who's just joined on YouTube as well, by the way. Uh, good morning in the USA and Canada. Hope you're all well. Uh, Tim, the question is, how do you think contractors will react to the shutdowns? Will they increase prices to cover their losses uh, or remain competitive uh, just, to get any, just to get any work they can, I suppose? I, that's a, it's a very good question. And I think, to be honest, everyone's in the same boat. Um, if, if mining companies don't have drilling budgets, there is no drilling. So there's no, um, there's no benefit of putting your prices up to cover losses. And we see this on a, on a local scale during, during downturns and, and other things, you know, the drillers help the mining company out and, you know, in return, the mining company gives them a bigger contract next year. Um, I really don't see the benefit in increasing prices to cover losses um, because there are going to be other companies out there that have got personal relationships with, with the mines and the, and the exploration projects that really, um, you know they're gonna they're gonna be loyal to their contractors and, and keep them on board. So no, I don't think there's gonna be a, a major increase. Uh, is it gonna gonna hit uh, the contractors hard? Both both mining contractors, drilling contractors, even down to, to catering and, and stuff. Yeah, uh, I think it's gonna be tough on them, especially if, like we said, if this crisis continues until Christmas, there's gonna be a lot of drill rigs sat doing nothing. Um, some some companies can can weather that storm and others can't, but it's it's no different really to a, to a financial downturn. Absolutely. Thank you, Tim. I've got a, now a broad question. Whoever wants to jump in uh, at the same time, uh, whoever jumps in first gets to answer it first. But uh, right now is a very scary time to be graduating from a geology degree. And uh, we're kind of coming up to, to graduation time for any universities that are still open or anyone teaching online. Uh, three things that students could be doing right now while they can't get out and work to improve their employability in the mining sector. Go for uh, it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really hard to say, but uh, I would say that we already mentioned that uh, data, data management. I'm thinking from uh, the exploration point of view, I think one of the one of the positive things that we might be able to, to draw from, from all of this situation is uh, that we will have some time, uh, some extra time, if you want, uh, to, um, 
to go through a, a big amount of data that we, we already have, but we didn't have time enough to, to, to go through and uh, to, uh, to digest, if you want. So I think that data management will be, will be very important uh, uh, um, during the next times. So I would say that that would be something that uh, you, if, 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 you, if you're going to uh, enter to the, to the industry world, you, you should be worried about. You know, so your skills in, uh, in data, in data management and uh, the abil your ability to, to work with. And can you suggest uh, maybe some good places to get test data sets? Um, I, don't, I think Paul was going to jump in there. Maybe you can answer that, Paul. Is there any, any good place for new graduates or people practicing in geology to get free data sets to work with on their GIS to, to practice their mapping skills there? Yes. Um, I'm going to put a plug in for British Columbia here, who during the period, this is medieval times for a few people, uh, from 1991, there was a turn down, uh, and uh, there was, shall we say, an administration that was not entirely favorable to mineral exploration and mining in the province of British Columbia here. But what we did have was um, a absolutely magnificent uh, man by the name of Ward Kilby, who under the aegis of Ron Smith in the British Columbia Geological Survey branch, produced uh, a, the map place, which was a, the beginnings of a GIS comprehensive database for British Columbia, which uh, became a world standard. Uh, Ward sadly passed away a few years ago, but the fruits of his labors are still there and still cutting edge and are being emulated by geological surveys pretty much around the world. Go to the government, go and suck those uh, databases dry and then look at it and let your mind sink into the pattern recognition. Never assume that the experts have done everything. You'll always find a different way of looking at things. Test every assumption, even your restrict, respected elders. Don't believe anything you hear. Test everything and you will find uh, a mineral deposit down the line. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. But it's, it's like cricket, not baseball. It's about scoring. 200 overs down the line. Uh, sorry about the cricket analogy. Uh, I'm sure only, only about 5% of the people listening will get it, but uh, it was worth it for them. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So um, I, I also know in, in terms of free data, uh, the European Union have a huge uh, repository of uh, GIS files, maps, uh, that you can, you can work with on GRASS, uh, which is a free bit of software. So if you can't get onto ARC or Map Info or any of the paid software, uh, get your head around uh, QJS while you're there. Anyway, I think that's uh, probably a very, very good time to, to wrap up. It's been really, really good to, uh, to catch up with you all. To Tim in St. Kitts, hope you're enjoying the sun there. Um, Jorge down in Santiago, thank you. And Paul and Gabriola, uh, thank you very much everybody for joining us. Uh, we'll be here again next week at the same time. You can join at spotlightmining.com slash register and check out the lineup when we know who's gonna be presenting as well. Thank you, have a great day everybody, cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Liam.